technically you're so far ahead of the sun. It's so refreshing to hear you. How did you get that? How did you get that? Yeah, I mean, I got it. I brought paper. Good morning, you. Good morning. I'm sorry. I brought paper, Madam Chair. Well, forgive you. I hope so. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And, uh, I, I feel embarrassed to hand out paper with all this technology. That's what it means to me today. There's a lot of extra copies. This is basically my floor report on the bill. And uh, you're welcome to ask any questions you have. I'm very happy that the Government Operations Committee has invited me to come here and testify. My name is Dick Sears, Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and uh, a Senator from Bennington County. So, with that, um, would you like me to start? Or? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, for adults in Vermont, cannabis is a legal product. Each year, a significant number of Vermont adults choose to spend hundreds of millions of dollars purchasing the product from a listed market here or from na the neighboring state of Massachusetts where it's, there is a regulated market. Representative Brownell knows that well. We're going to have a store in Williamstown, Main Street of Williamstown, which is about four miles from his home. That's right. <laughs> um, Vermont's current law is awkward because it has legalized the product without creating any safe legal access to it. We saw what this leads to in the news about a store on Church Street Marketplace in Burlington being raided for selling marijuana products. The Attorney General recently changed his position to fully supporting the creation of a regulated market, citing the need for consumer protection and open, transparent, and smart approach to public protection. The path to cannabis consumer and public protection has been incremental and well-informed in Vermont. Since 2006, we have taken a step-by-step -step approach to reform, starting with the medical marijuana laws, creation of a regulated dispensary market, decriminalization, and finally legalization. S-54 is grounded in this uniquely Vermont approach and benefits from the research conducted by the Governor's Commission on Marijuana. And I might add that much of this bill is a part of what was S-241 that we passed several years ago in the Senate. Um, the Governor's Commission report, as well as um, information, particularly from Massachusetts, which has got a cannabis control board, is moving in the same direction. Um, I was watching a public TV show um, with uh, two senators and a representative, and the senator said, well, this bill is about consumer protection. The representative said it's about social justice. And another one said it's about um, the uh, strict market regulations. And I thought, all three are right. That's what this bill is about. So the consumer protection features of the bill are replacing the illicit market with a strictly regulated market, provide safe access to predictable and <coughs> consistent products, information tools for informed, responsible consumption, mandatory third-party testing requirements. And this is particularly important with edibles. We found that edibles are being sold on the street today, and nobody has any idea what the potency is of those edibles. So you may hear a lot of testimony about, oh, well, don't allow edibles. Well, we've already got them, I'm sorry. Um, there's strict labeling requirements showing potency, requirements for child-resistant packaging, bans on advertising that appeals to children and encourage overconsumption and makes false claims. There are rules related to manufacturing of single-serve edible products, a ban on cannabis products bundled with non-cannabis products, that's the, particularly with the CBD oil from hemp that is now being sold widely. We want to make sure that people realize what it is they're purchasing is not uh, hemp-related, but it's actually marijuana-related. And there's a ban on cannabis products that include alcohol or tobacco, and that is another <coughs> part of the illicit market today. 
Uh, there's strict market regulation. There's new, de dedicated, and expert regulatory body, bodies created. A seed and sale tracking regulations are required. Constraints favoring a Vermont scale business model. There's limited, limited regulated business operating licenses. Uh, there are criminal background checks for licensing. People have to be at least 21 to access, to gain access to stores to purchase or possess marijuana. The bans on the gifting for sales loophole, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, where you buy a t-shirt for $50 and you are gifted a certain amount of marijuana, marijuana product. Um, that's been going on in Vermont. Actually, I saw something on Facebook Nelson yesterday and somebody who's operating a, uh, a little uh, club, membership only, but clearly in Bennington are planning on charging you a fee, and that is also banned here. Um, the banned marketing that appeals to children and youth provides for criminal background checks for employees and licenses allows municipalities to opt out of hosting cannabis businesses. And this was a great deal of debate in the Senate Judiciary Committee about the, as well as uh, Senate government ops, about whether an opt-in or an opt-out. So that's obviously, we chose the opt-in opt and, uh, I mean, the opt-out process. And uh, you may uh, hear some testimony from the League and others about, the, about which way they like to go. The, the Senate chose the opt out. We were afraid that we'd get into situations like they've had in Colorado where uh, many communities won't bring it in, but they want the revenue from it. Um, it requires education of cannabis businesses related to enforcement and employee training and rules related to security and health and safety requirements for cannabis businesses. I want to say a little bit about what's not in the bill, which is public protection, the roadway safety that we've all heard a lot about. If there are, in fact, as the RAND report saw, cited, 80,000 Vermonters currently using uh, marijuana, I suggest we already have a road safety problem. And we should deal with that separately. But Vermont's DUI or impaired law is one of the strictest in the country. It is applicable to all, i.e. prescription drugs, marijuana, illegal drugs. And it, is against the, it is against the law to drive impaired to the slightest degree. I have to remind folks of that. The slightest degree standard was act, enacted in 2015 and is a nearly zero tolerance standard. So it, while we all assume for alcohol it's 0 .08, you can be at 0 .02. And if you are showing signs of being impaired, that's what the zero tolerance means. You can be charged with a DUI. So I think a lot of folks have, uh, don't realize how tough our laws are currently. Uh, social equity and social justice that I spoke of early. There's a priority for small local producers to ensure a diverse marketplace. It mandates one of the control board members have a background in social justice. Priority is given to licensed applicants that provide good wages, benefits, environmental and clean energy programs. Nonviolent drug offenses will not automatically disqualify applicants. The regulatory requirements unique to small growers and priority for applicants that are Vermont residents. Um, there's consideration of geographic dis distribution of cannabis establishments. For, to allow for even distribution of cannabis businesses throughout the state. The bill prioritizes women and minority-owned businesses and career invest, investment. Um, we established a 16% tax rate to help undercut the illicit market, trying to keep it as low as possible, and a 2% local option tax to help, that's an up to, uh, to help municipalities with implementation. Massachusetts, I believe, has a 3%. And what they found there was they also had what's called host agreements, and they wanted to avoid that. And the host agreements, of, for example, in uh, Northampton, Mass, um, the, uh, somebody applied for a license, and they said, oh, yeah, if you, 
if you can donate $100,000 to the Girls and Boys Club, we'd be happy to work on you with a license. <laughs> uh, we did talk to a, the vice chair of the um, uh, select board in, uh, in the Berkshires. Um, how did I lose that? Was it Great Barrington? Great Barrington. Yeah. I think I and that um, yeah, it should be on the list. He, he was fascinating to talk to because he's been through the local government piece. He said their biggest problem really has been parking. <laughs> um, people parking in places that they shouldn't. I'm not going to walk through the bill, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions about our bill. Yes, Jim. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, in terms of the setup and the structure, you indicated that you looked to Massachusetts in yep. terms of the Cannabis Control Board. Yep. Um, we've heard, and we haven't dug down to a lot of the details, but uh, a number of states have done it differently, um, like under perhaps their Liquor Control Board or some other mechanism. Today, we, as you know, currently we have it under <coughs> the medical marijuana under the Department of Public Service. Yep. Um, I'm curious as to what made you go in that direction of setting well, up a new entity? A lot of it was done, a lot of that decision making was from the uh, Committee on Government Operations. But we were worried in judiciary um, that if we put it under liquor control that it, it wouldn't get the attention it needed. And because there's a lot, I mean, the bill requires a lot of rulemaking. And that board is going to have a lot of responsibility to develop the rules um, for the uh, implementation, particularly in the first year and a half. And we felt that, at least at this point, that it should be its own separate control board. Now, um, there was some discussion about putting it under, actually putting it under agriculture, not liquor control. Because agri it, it, in fact, uh, the hemp is under agriculture. Um, agriculture will have a role in the testing. And so that was one consideration. I think uh, there are, you know, there, there's a variety of ways to go about it. I don't know that our, I don't think ours is perfect, but we did model it after Massachusetts. We started out with a five member board and then cut it to three in the appropriation <coughs> process. Only because you're spending the money for the Cannabis Control Board before you have any revenue. So it was a question of how much you want to spend in anticipation of future revenue. Rob? Um, morning, Senator Sears. Morning. I'm curious to know what, how your vision would be about how this is going to interact with the homegrown component of this, in that I know there's been a fair amount of discussion about the, the black market, the illicit market. One, does this do anything to address that issue as far as will people still be allowed to? People would still be allowed to grow as they are currently. Um, now I liken it to you know, my effort to grow tomatoes every summer. Uh, sometimes I am very unsuccessful and um, I can go to the market and buy tomatoes, but if I were growing, which I'm not gonna be doing by the way, growing marijuana, I have to go to the black market currently. Uh, if I looked at what I spent to grow tomatoes in the summer versus what I would spend in the market, I'm obviously not making a good financial decision. You know, one of the things, we went to a couple of medical marijuana dispensaries yep. that we currently have, and they were both pretty clear about that since the passage of the homegrown, they've seen a 25 to 30 percent decrease in, in their business. So that sort of make you think that more people are growing their own tomatoes. Yep. Well, I think it's that plus they found now that it's legal, both the illicit market and the ability to go to other states. Um, the ability to go to Massachusetts right now, but it won't be long before they can go to Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York. Perhaps New Jersey, maybe New Hampshire, Florida, Maine. So I think it's going to be all around us. So that's going to cut into this medical dispensary. The one advantage of, of being a medical 
card recipient would be you're allowed under another bill you're allowed to grow a little bit more but you don't pay the taxes so if I happen to grow some of my own I have the space and the inclination and yep. you're a good friend of mine and would it be illegal for me to work something out with you or um, whatever you give me goes towards my tax bill nope I cannot charge you for it like you can it's uh and it has to be under an ounce. Yeah. Uh, so it, it wouldn't be, it, it would still be. I mean, you can share. Sale. There's nothing that says you can't share. Sure. It's the sale or the, the gifting for some other thing, if you said. You know. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions for the Senator? Oh. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Um, Welcome to the legislature. Thank you. We're elected after, uh, or appointed after a few of us that have already been elected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my concern is about children, young mm -hmm. people. Yep. And with the potency of, of cannabis today, um, it, it certainly has, a, I think, a very negative impact when young users are involved. So. How important do you think it is in terms of educating uh, young people about the impact of using with the hope of them consider using later when their bodies are able to handle it? Well, I think we all should be concerned about youngsters, particularly the younger they are. Um, we've heard evidence even under 25 is probably, you know, your brain's still developing and there's problems. I, I answer that in two ways. One is tremendously important. However, if the governor, well, then with all due respect to the governor, if the governor thought it was critically important, he would have put $6 million into his budget for prevention. And that's what his health commissioner has suggested for prevention. And I think you, it's fine to, to talk that way, and I have no problem with spending that $6 million. The commission actually recommended, I believe, 23 million on prevention and treatment from the uh, cannabis uh, sales. So, you know, it, I, I totally agree. Um, but it's here today, and ignoring that it's here today um, is, is a mistake to me. And as you know, there's very little the legislature can do to come up with a six million in new money. Um, so I, you know, if, if it were, I, that's my response to it. I totally agree with everyone who thinks we should be putting more into prevention. On that topic, I, I happened across a, a press conference yesterday where um, the Secretary of Human Services was talking about um, the need for a comprehensive prevention program, not just the, you know, do not do this, do not do that, but what, what are the alternatives for our youth? And I think um, I can appreciate that, that we should all be thinking about uh, how we are prioritizing the things that, uh, that we want to provide for young people as healthy alternatives and not just the no, no, no. I appreciate that. Uh, Bob, you have a question, and then we should probably let Senator Sears go on with his way. In the context of Vermont marketing its brand, mm -hmm. in, in some sections of the country, Vermont pot is already known. Yep. Has there been any discussion with the administration or marketing or anybody else whether this is going to end up being an issue? I think we're, we're hopeful that the regulations and the social justice portion of the bill will result, result in something similar to the craft brewery industry in Vermont. Um, and, and as an interesting antidote, Senator Ash was in Seattle visiting a friend and went into one of the CBD stores. Um, and there was a Vermont, pro Vermont made product there and they said that was one of their best sellers. So I think the Vermont brand could be used in, in many ways in this. And, and that's where the importance of testing potency comes in, to me. Um, I don't, people, 
talk to a lot of people about the illicit market, and they have no idea what the potency is of the product they're buying. Um, they have, many of them have no idea what it might be laced with. So I think there's, you know, we have to recognize that the market is here. Um, people are, are buying it. Um, and uh, the people that are selling it are not necessarily the most scrupulous people in the state. the work that you all have Thank done you. on this bill and, and um, I also very much appreciate the way you've laid it out to help us understand your focus on consumer protection and market regulation. Um, again, you know, we always know there will be differences between the House and the Senate and how we do it as long as the goal is the same and that is to bring a, a, a product, uh, bring social justice, consumer protection uh, product that people know what it is. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator. Thank you. Thank you. So, committee, we have uh, Graham and Stephanie here now to go through um, to go through the fiscal note on S54. And so, Jim, you're going to need to fire up that iPad again because I'm guessing Stephanie's electronic. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie is human, but her presentation is electronic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I am the um, sort of dry, what's the cost of the board <laughs> across the three year period estimate person? And Graham is the tax revenue estimate person. Okay. <laughs> No. So um, the, the board um, was structured in a certain way when the bill came out of um, the Judiciary Committee and then it was restructured in the Senate Appropriations Committee. That's why there's two estimates in the fiscal note. Um, the board was a five-member board um, at a lower pay structure in the Judiciary Committee um, and was decided to be a three-member board member three members of the board as it came out of Senate appropriations at a higher salary level. And so I can give you a little bit of detail about the cost estimate of the board. Um, the first year cost is not a full year cost um, because it, the, the, the members are anticipated to come on late August, September, and then the executive director and the uh, uh, executive assistant uh, you know, a month or two later. So that's, that's the reason that there's, um, and then there's also some other components of the, of the board cost. Um, so would that be helpful to the committee just to, to understand sort of the component pieces of that? So, okay. So um, three members of the board. The chair um, is paid about, about $107,000, It was pegged to 66% of a superior court judge and then the other two members at 50%. So those would be about $80,000 of a salary. Um, I'm just talking the salary, not the fully loaded cost of the position. Um, the executive director and the executive assistant are, are both um, anticipated to not be entry level type positions. So the, the executive director position is, is comparable to the chair in salary um, and the executive assistant would be in around the seventy seventy one thousand um, dollar salary. So that's a very it's an experienced executive assistant, and that's the um, the, the salary structure in the um, Senate appropriations estimate. In addition to the salary, there's um, employees with full benefits, um, and that's at um, a forty percent estimate. That's assumed that. That's, a, that's an estimate that assumes people pick the family health plan. That's what drives, that's the biggest driver of, of, of a benefit load cost. Um, in addition to the salaries of the board, uh, I've estimated the operating costs because it'll need some space and computers and phones, et cetera. And what I did is I looked at several boards around the state. Um, the Natural Resources Board operating expense had been consistently about $500,000. I looked at the size of their sort of uh, operation versus a five-man operation and proportionally allocated that. So I have about $125,000 a year in 
for operating expenses for the board. Um, and I, I, I know um, the commissioner of buildings was, it was uh, wondering if there was a, a piece included in that for fee for space and rent. And I, I did inform them that that would be probably in the $47,000 a year range as a part of that um, estimate. Uh, the, other, the other two pieces that I'm including in that estimate are um, some general counsel assistance, not necessarily a position, um, but some general counsel assistance across the three years that's declining, heavier at the front part. Um, and then also some contracting, ability to contract um, that's also declining over the three years. That's why, you know, even though the salaries roll out full, it steps down a little bit over the three years. So that's, that's the source of um, what is in the bill as it passed out of the Senate, an $810,000 appropriation estimated to be in that um, 960 and then actually dropping because the, the contracting costs and some of the general counsel falls off in the third year more. Um, two other pieces that I wanted to speak to about the bill as it came out of the Senate. So these, as it's structured in the Senate, it's spending in anticipation of receipts into the cannabis special fund. Um, so there are no receipts in it against which to lodge the 8, 10, and 20. Um, we think there will be some receipts related to fees in 21. The, um, there is language in the bill that allows that fund to be made whole by the tax revenue um, in the event of the timing um, so that you actually end uh, FY22 with that fund in balance so that you have a, you can only anticipate receipts if there are really going to be the receipts that you're spending into there. And so that was the mechanism by which um, we would cover that event, you know, if, if, if the fee revenue estimate is off, um, then those receipts wouldn't be there. But at, at some point, the tax revenue comes in, and so that tax revenue would be, made, be making the special fund whole um, so that fiscally you are sound in the structure. That's the, um, the, the other point I wanted to, to, to make sure that I was, um, <coughs> the Joint Fiscal Office, me, was adamant about it in the Senate Appropriations Committee because you, you need to actually um, have, when you're spending, you're essentially going to be deficit spending into that special fund early on and you want to make sure that you have a plan to come back to balance over time. Right. Yeah. So just so that I said, so you're yeah. saying that the, if the licensing fees don't cover the, the spending, then the yeah. tax revenues from the sales will make up the difference, right. at least initially. Yes. Okay. And it's especially, because you're, you're, spending, you're spending in a year when you don't have, so you have to actually pay, the, the licensing fees have to pay the ongoing and the payoff of the, the, the sort of one-time debt that you start out with. And so if that doesn't, that doesn't come to equilibrium on its own. The tax revenue helps to get that there. Jim. So Senator Sears talked about um, a recommendation that you received about six million for education. Is that in here? No, or? there's no, there's no, this is only, this fiscal number only speaks to the cost of operating the board. The, um, the, um, Proposals related to, um, like the the health department request mm -hmm. for expenditure, um, those are not part of this fiscal note, and so the the Senate did not um, include any uh, forward appropriations or recommendations about how um, the tax revenue, aside from this fiscal, you know, make the, the special fund fiscally whole. Aside from that, they did not recommend anything regarding how the tax revenue is expended in this bill. And aside from the cannabis bill in the governor's recommend, was there an increase in funding for after school programs or backfilling what we used to use the tobacco fund for in terms of uh, prevention activities in school? Um, I mean, that's, that's not, kind of, not in the 20 bill as it's, as it's either proposed by the governor or, or passed in the House right now. Passed by the House right now. Yeah. Follow up, Jim. Okay. Go. So 
getting back to the board part, which you spent yeah. a lot of time in, uh, obviously going from a five member to a three member board really is a change in salaries. I mean, there's not a significant change in in the total cost. There was not a significant change. The, the, the salary structure, and I didn't bring my detail on the judiciary amendment, but, um, but the salary structure for all five members was, first of all, all five are the same, and it was a, a lower salary structure, I think, in the $50,000. Okay, so on, on the staffing, we've got a, an executive director and an executive assistant. Is yes. that it? For the staffing, there is an allocation of dollars in my estimate for general counsel. I don't anticipate a position of a general counsel to the board, but for purchasing some additional legal assistance because they're very heavy on the the rulemaking and yeah. things. So, okay. but I don't. Yeah, but no, there are only five positions created. It just seems a little board. top heavy to me. You got a three-member board and two people doing all the work. But. Maybe I'm <laughs> so, reading so, into it. So the, the nature of the work is is a policy. Uh, the, 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 the policy forming and the rulemaking, and then also setting up the registry. So, um, and that was the choice of okay. the way the Senate structured. Okay. Thank you. Um, going back to the deficit of spending, um, what what agency or department would the deficit spending come out of, in other words. So it, it would, it, you're saying this bill sets up a special fund. Yep. And the appropriation of 810 is out of that special fund. So that that appropriation in FY20, there's no revenue anticipated into that special fund in 20. So it's got zero revenue and 810 of spending. So it ends FY20 at negative 810. And that is essentially floated on the treasury of the state. So how the cash flow of the state, state. will be. And then, okay. and then you know, there'll be a, a, an additional thing because it has to carry the interest on that, and then it has to pay it back over time, and that's okay. the structure. Okay. okay, thank you. It's not something that we really think about all that often. Um, John. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first question, you, you looked at the, the fees being collected in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> as pr to, to develop this analysis, for the, the, for the fee side of the revenue, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Did to you look at any other side. states or just Massachusetts? Because the Senator Sears said this bill's partially modeled on Massachusetts law. Um, the fee structure, so I'm Graham Campbell, Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, the fee structures vary significantly from state to state. So, the without in the absence of actually creating a fee structure within the bill itself, um, and our concerns at the Joint Fiscal Office about spending and anticipation of receipts. Um, the fee structure in the bill, I don't believe, is actually modeled. It's, uh, there's no fee structure to, to speak of, but the actual receipts are, would be similar to what if the state decided to go with a Massachusetts-style fee structure that we anticipate would come in fees. It could be a lot less than that if you went with other state models or more than that if you know, you know some other state models, but I think the bill itself says that it has to generate at least the amount listed here. Okay. And that's, if you did a Massachusetts style fee structure, that's what we estimate would get you there. Okay. So it's setting a minimum amount for the recommendation to come back on the fees. So the board wouldn't necessarily have to choose the Massachusetts style, they would just have to get to, um, to what's the number yeah. here. So my second question is, you estimated out three years to FY22. So that's basically st standing up um, the Cannabis Control Board. Yeah. Um, but it's really not ha having to take on a regulatory uh, position. You know, for example, if you compare it to the Liquor Control Board, right. I mean, they have law enforcement, uh, you know, licensing staff, things like that. I mean, you're not just going to have an executive director and an executive assistant um, starting to do enforcement as well as licensing. Did you look beyond FY22 at costs? So um, the, there is a rec there's a re um, requirement in the bill for them to come back with what should be mm -hmm. the structure of the board um, right. looking at that. And so we did not you know, say this is what the world will look like after it's stood up and what the cost need will be. Right. Um, so that, so there, there was some question about whether or not you have three um, full-time employees that are board members, but for the liquor board, those aren't, those are paid the $50 a day. So do you, so look at other structures and say, is this the structure that needs to continue? Um, 
so we did not, um, that, that report would be coming and then that would be sort of a next phase of understanding what that need, would need to be. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, um, so I'm going to be showing the committee the money um, from the tax. So the, the Senate bill um, had a 16% state excise tax with a 2% local option. Um, our office only estimated the potential revenue from a 16% excise tax. <clears throat> you can see in the table there, this is what we estimate will be the revenues um, beginning in fiscal 22, which would be year one of the implementation. Um, we put a range around this because um, there's quite a bit of uncertainty about how, how quickly the board will get up and running, how quickly we have retail stores. Um, and so, as you can see, it sort of ramps up as you um, go into year two and three, and that's consistent with what we've seen in other states. So that's sort of the headline summary, and I can speak more into the details as the committee wishes, but essentially, this model was a, um, kind of a, uh, a model of cons um, working together with other states. We work, so when I say we, myself and the tax department worked together to develop a model in November, um, December of 2018 as part of the Governor's Marijuana Commission. And this model was based upon um, Colorado's model for estimating their first year receipts, which came within, as you see, within 1% of their actual receipts. They estimated 67 million for their first year, and they actually received 67 and a half million. So they were very close. So we thought that was a pretty good model. We also relied a lot on um, speaking with our colleagues in Oregon and Washington. Um, so we use Colorado because Colorado is a relatively high usage state, like Vermont, um, and it's a relatively high tourism state, like Vermont. And we use Washington and Oregon because um, those two states have um, legal marijuana, and they also have cross-order issues like we would have with Massachusetts. Um, and so these estimates are based upon are based upon a slew of different data, which we are here, including population and information from the Legislative Commons and the U.S. Census Bureau, um, the uh, usage of marijuana from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Um, we estimated the price of cannabis using a scientific website called priceofweed.com. <laughs> um, but that's actually what Colorado has used you know, and used in their model. Um, Rob has a question. Yeah. Well, I just, just so that I'm, I'm, so the very first screen that we saw about the revenue, that was from the licensing. Yes, from the yes, yes. yes. Right, and then this one is around just the retail sales, correct? The, the, okay. the, ta the tax. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health was used in this, um, which showed that Vermont has the highest usage rate in the country, um, even higher than Colorado. <laughs> um, there are various reports put out in Colorado, Oregon, and Washington about um, post-legalization post of open usage in those states. And, you know, so there's two, two terms we talk about when we um, are estimating revenues. The prevalence, um, you know, how, what percentage of your population has used it, and then consumption, which is, for those people who do use it, how much do they consume? And so those are the two variables that we try to estimate we use the other states' data for. So I just want to clarify, were the highest on the medical marijuana or were the highest on recreational marijuana? We're the highest. So the survey says, um, have you used marijuana within the past month or three months? And the percentage of our population that has said yes to that question is the highest in the country. That makes sense. So that's that's answer, that's an, answering the prevalence question. They didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I. So it's answering the prevalence question. So we we know that yeah. uh, it's something around 35, 37 percent answered yes to that question, but we don't know whether they are heavy users or whether they use it, you know, just a little bit. Um, sure. So that's why we use information from the other states to get a sense of, in a legal market, how much were they seeing in their states. Um, and then we had to make some of the following assumptions here. Um, we estimated that consumption by residents, so our model is broken down by both resident usage and travelers who would come to the state of Vermont, that <coughs> residents would consume between five or six ounces a year. Um, Colorado, um, their estimate was about, they did a study and it was about six ounces per year, and Washington was around just over six, I think. Um, we, in all the other states, 
the price of cannabis fell precipitously upon legalization. Um, however, the revenues continued to grow, which sort of means that you know, even though the price is going down, as the market gets more and more <coughs> mature, you see um, more and more sales and more and more revenue. Mike has a question. Um, with that price drop, were they aware of uh, how that affected the black market? Yeah, so um, the next bullet point there, Oregon saw their black market fall off a cliff um, when that happened. Um, our estimate is that our market would be still 20% of the market yet in a fully mature market, so this is year two, we say, um, of legalization will be about 20% of the market. Oregon's is about 15% right now. Mm -hmm. Now Sandy has a question. Yeah, uh, how many of these states have also legalized people to grow their own and, uh, and process it in the home when you're doing this type of price? You know, I'm not sure whether what the status of legal home growing is. Um, in our model, we estimated that 10% um, <coughs> of Vermonters will continue to home grow. Um, Oregon's is about 8% right now. So we think ours is a little bit higher because of that fact that we, um, we legalized on a home growing basis. We legalized that possession before actual retail sales. And so we thought that ours would be a little bit higher. Um, if you assumed a higher home grow rate, then it would be lower revenue. So, so I'm guessing that possibly Legislative Council has a, a sense of that? Yep. Uh, so all of the states allow home grow except for Washington State. Um, you also have, uh, and you have, and we have a chart with like whatever the certain limits are. Vermont has, in terms of the states that allow home grow, Vermont has the either equal to or the smallest number of plants that we allow for folks to grow. Um, I think we also have to factor in that a number of these states, because they're all passed by ballot initiatives, what predated the recreational <coughs> or the, the adult use commercial market was medical initiatives. And so a lot of those states also have um, very loose kind of medical laws that predate the, the commercial. So you can, uh, so you have what and Graham can maybe talk about, about kind of the gray market. So you have like the illegal market and then you have this other kind of fuzzy space of where there are a lot of people are able to grow under the medical provisions. And some of that is closed up since they brought on the commercial, but it, it, there are still some, some things that are different between like what Vermont has, which is a very, very controlled medical uh, program versus what they have in some other states that probably affects some of the numbers. The, the, the floor is here. Where's the ceiling in terms of authorization for number of homegrown, how large a capacity that other states get? Do other states? You know, I'd have to look and see, but I know that um, uh, Colorado had, and I don't, I think that somebody, I can take a look at it, but it used to be able to use to be able to grow for uh, a lot of plants and for a number of people, same in Maine, so I'd have to go back and take a look at what's kind of close, if they've closed so some of that up, but um, some of it is, has been quite quite large, and I think that's one of the issues around, um, you know, how much you move the, il the illegal or illicit market into the, into the <coughs> regulated market. John and then Rob. So, Graham, I believe you said that, that Oregon's <coughs> black market sort of declined fairly dramatically. Mm -hmm. do, do we know why? Um, when I spoke to their analyst, <laughs> their analysts, they said it was because of the price drop that, um, not just the actual dollar price drop, but also just the think about the theoretical cost. You know, you're not you don't risk being caught by going and purchasing a legal substance in a store, um, and so they said that the legal <clears throat> the legal market had competitive prices. It didn't have the cost of potentially didn't, having a fine or even going to jail, and so that was their explanation um, yeah. to the extent that that's that. The full story. I'm not yeah, I guess I was just wondering if there's some distinction between Oregon and how they chose to regulate marijuana in Colorado and Washington State and some of the other states that have regulated it, Massachusetts. Just be, I'm just interested because obviously, you know, curbing the black market I think is important to do in this bill. Um, so if there's any lessons to be learned from other states, that would be great. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Oregon's tax rate is 17%, I believe. Um, so it's 
quite close to yep. to this, and but they also charge their sales tax to it as well. So they would have a higher tax rate than we would have. Um, and so, do we have data on all the states' taxation of marijuana, both? You know, full tax is not just a special marijuana tax, but if there's a sales tax charge, if there's a local option tax, just for comparative purposes. You or myself or Michelle. Okay, yeah, great. I, yeah, I think it's worth uh, having us remember that in addition to the levers around taxation, that um, the illicit market can be reduced by intentionally trying to bring those growers above board, you know, giving giving them a, uh, an opportunity to to come into the legal grow framework. Um, and I don't know, uh, I don't know how far you all um, have gone in terms of trying to understand what the marijuana market looks like in your own home districts, but uh, and and who knows whether they would even invite you in, but um, start asking around because it's kind of interesting to to understand how some of these operations have been uh, have been developing. Um, and I've been hearing from they don't want legalization. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. They they might not want to because they might like to be able to continue doing what they're doing. On the other hand, if we're looking at um, a regulated product that is safe and predictable for consumers. Um, I think it's a good idea to figure out how to how to bring those folks above board. Um, Rob had a question, then Nelson. Um, yeah, and I have to blame my question on Senator Sears because I never thought I would be comparing marijuana to tomatoes. But <laughs> my, my question is: is um, what is the shelf life? Let's say that I am one of those homegrown types that grows my own marijuana, how long is that product good for? Do you have any idea? I have no <laughs> idea. Do <laughs> you have a sweet answer? Depends upon how well it's dried or processed. Sure, yeah. 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 I mean, I, and I think that's a question yeah. we yeah. could ask our dispensaries yeah. because they, you know, they've been working in this Makes marketplace sense. for a while. Thank you. Yeah. Nelson? Tell them how you can it. I can't it up here. <laughs> ah, that is preserving. Uh, my question is, what impact did you see in these other states on other type drugs when they legalized this? That's a very good question. Um, that's not something we asked with the other, like you're talking about, say, alcohol consumption or even other the illicit oils. drugs. Yeah. Um, that's not something that we, we looked at. That's something. Um, that we considered in, um, at least for the revenue stand that uh, people use marijuana more, that they drank less, we might see less alcohol-related um, revenues. Um, but in the, in, the, in the experience of the other states, I asked Colorado about it, they didn't, it's not something that they tracked actively where they saw a specific decline, but they didn't see like their alcohol fall, their alcohol taxes fall off. Cliff, um, but they couldn't definitively say that you know marijuana had an impact on their, their tobacco oh, or sorry their their alcohol. You know, yeah, what I'm looking at is this other illicit uh, drugs that are being sold out there. Once you legalize one, what impact does it have on the dealers probably selling the multitude of stuff? Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Um, Analysis of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, how's the crime rate changed? You know, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think those are probably the best answered by um, people in the, you know, in, yeah. in public safety. Or we, we can do some exploration of that. So, so put that question in your parking lot, and we'll make sure that we come back to it. Bob. Well, maybe another parking lot question. We have discussion about the security of our voter lists and some of the things we're doing. In other states where they have done this, the feds come in and <coughs> look at the registration material for people that are still federal crime. Yeah, yeah. That's Don't a good know. question. No. That's a policy question. So we should actually let them get back to their their fiscal analysis, but put, put that on the list of questions to ask legislative council. 
I think those are all really good questions. And there, there are people there who can help you with that. Um, but one more, one more assumption I wanted to add is that we assumed. So remember, I talked about prevalence and consumption. Um, we assume that although Vermont has high prevalence, that our consumption was a little bit lower than than other states because our population is older. Um, we have our median age; I think is eight years less than Colorado's, and it's I think four or so years less than Oregon and Washington. So, under the assumption that um, older users consume a little bit less, only a, <coughs> modestly less. We're not talking a huge cutoff, but. Um, and then finally, so the question is, how does this estimate compare to what other states did? And this is someone that we go to, Steph and I go to these fiscal analysts conferences. They say, figure out ways to show your, your results or whatever in interesting ways. And so this chart, what it attempts to say is, OK, what if Colorado, um, Washington, and Oregon had the same population and tax rate as we are proposing in S54? based upon their actual revenues that they've brought in and their taxable sales, what would that equate to in Vermont? So what this what this is showing is so the Vermont estimate range is that high low that you see and you can see year one, two, and three. What we're saying is that we're gonna be relatively similar to these other states. Um, the high end so the high end of year one basically says that we'll be a Colorado. We'll be a Colorado type state. And if on the high end of year three, it means that we'll be basically Colorado. On the low end, we'll be a little bit less than Washington. So Washington in year one here, theirs was passed by ballot initiative. And there was not a whole lot of, I don't want to say thought that went into it, but they had a really slow startup time. And get going, and you can see their line is pretty steep, it's a little bit steeper. So the second year, they sort of put in the rules and stuff in place, and, they, and the licenses, and that's when they started seeing the revenue. So year one here, the low for Vermont would be that you know we saw slow licensing, we saw slow retail sales because of that licensing, and so it took us a little bit to get going. Year one up high means that we are like Colorado. Everyone flocked to us because we were, you know, it's a tourism state. You know, Vermont has a specific appeal. Um, so at the low end, year one, you're saying four million for Vermont, which <coughs> once you take out the when you, once you take out the revenue that you need to backfill the fund, you, you're not looking at a whole lot of extra revenue on that low end to do some of the prevention and. And uh, public health outreach that we're that we were talking about earlier. So yeah, not not with that year no. that year one, which is 2022 20, in this sort of picture, mm -hmm. that that would be true. That you would if if we make the low end and we have a deficit in the fund, you're you're not likely to have much in the way of excess capacity in that tax. <coughs> um, and so I think. Um, there's, you'll hear a lot of talk about like, oh, the other so-and-so state had made this much money in revenue, did this many in sales. Um, just I think for <coughs> everyone to be mindful that you know have to adjust for population, adjust by tax rate, and so that's essentially what this tries to do. Um, this this model was created in sort of mid-December. Um, we there's since been some news reports from Massachusetts and California that their um, their first year estimates have been ambitious. Um, they've missed because their licensing has taken longer to get up and going. So I'm not saying that these were going to be towards the lower end, but the more data that we get that shows you know other states' legalization and their first year process, um, not saying that we would you know have those issues, but um, it's something that we would you know keep our eye on and potentially revise this um, as going forward with new data. So how, how did your assumptions account for Vermont's demographic shifts you know, in terms of um, slow population growth, um, becoming a much greater state, as you mentioned, all the people you know, consume? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in, it's in two areas. One is the we adjusted the consumption level down um, <clears throat> relative to the other states for that older population. And two, the population um, sort of cornerstone of these estimates is 
the population of Vermont, and then from there we backed out marijuana users from um, from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, that prevalence question, have you used marijuana in the past month? And so the projections for population, which come from the legislative economists, are incorporated into this model. So that would, those projections project that Vermont will, become, will be becoming an older state mm -hmm. going forward. So that's how it's, it's incorporated into this model. Alex, your question? Yes. Rob and then Nelson. Um, has your study focused exclusively on the revenue side or have you taken a look at the expense side as well as far as were there any increases because of globalization to I don't know, public safety education health care or did you just focus exclusively on the income side so far the revenue side so there there, there is no projection assuming the market is up and, and running on those sort of indirect costs in the future in this fiscal note. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Nelson? Yeah, I, when you're talking about population, I wanted, was there any influx in any of the populations in any of these states when this became legalized? Because of marijuana? Well, was there a fluctuation? I don't know if you could tell if it's marijuana. Um, like. Oregon and Colorado are some of the fastest growing, especially Colorado, are some of the fastest growing states in the country. Um, there are a lot of factors that would influence that. You know, those states are, um, they see immigration, <coughs> they have faster econ growing economies than Vermont. Um, but, no, I mean, the analysts that I spoke to, the other states did not specifically mention any population growth from marijuana specifically. And I don't, I don't, believe I've seen any study that has seen people moving to a state simply because of marijuana. Any, any tourism impact? Tourism, for sure, yeah. Uh, the tourism, that's one of the reasons why we looked at Colorado's um, experience, because they're a high tourism state, specifically for marijuana. We are a high tourism state, and we're not even legal yet. Um, and so we anticipated we'd be sort of like them, and that's why we used their model for estimating what our potential tourism revenue um, from marijuana would be. So I appreciate it. Just to, to close the loop on the, the question about indirect costs, there's no sort of um, indirect um, revenue impacts either in this fiscal note. Yes, that's true. That. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. right. I mean, when we were touring yeah. the Milton facility, we saw the the specialized um, processing curing room yep. that uh, that was manufactured by a Vermont company. I happen to have a constituent who has a security business who would really like to, to be able to tap into mm -hmm. some of the uh, some of the market around providing security for grow facilities and retail facilities. So you know I think there's a lot more that maybe we would like to be able to predict in terms of what the benefits are to some of the ancillary businesses. Um, and I would guess that we could probably find some of that uh, from the states whose markets are a little more fully developed. Um, but at any rate, is that uh, anything else you, you would like us to uh, know or understand? No, that's it. The one thing I would add, just tangential to that point, I spoke to Colorado about their experience with um, any, did they count any sort of, uh, not indirect, but a little bit more direct, so the fair example was, um, does this have any effect on your grant list, your municipal grant list? And uh, he said, potentially, because a lot of their marijuana processing facilities um, occupied old vacant warehouses, um, but that's not something that they quantified for state revenue purposes. Right. So. We do have Great. Uh, any other questions for these fine fiscal people? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming to join us.